Hey guys, thank you so much for supporting our content. If you've not done so already, please subscribe, share, and like our videos. Today I'm chatting to Ronnie L. Murawudzi. He's one of those people that are multi-talented. I mean, the list is endless. He's a chief operations officer at an investment firm. He is a radio presenter, a gospel recording, an award-winning artist. He's a father. The list is endless. So there's so much for us to chat about. Thank you so much, Womura uh, Woodsy. I really appreciate you taking the time. No, Nanda, thank you very much for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Finally, it's happening. Yeah. Um, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much to talk about. Um, maybe let's start with your uh, current role as yeah. a chief operations officer. I think you've been in that role now for close to or more than six years. Six years yeah. um, and, and evidently, the fact that you are there that long, you are doing well and enjoying it. Yes. Um, what exactly does a chief operations officer do? So, funny enough, this is the longest role I've ever actually held in any company. Um, so, it's quite a, an interesting way how I got it. And mm -hmm. it actually involved doing a whole career change. So, if you look at my CV, you look, you'll see that uh, for nine years or so, I was in the HR space. Mm -hmm. And um, really, I mean, HR is quite broad, but you can only do so much mm -hmm. in it. So. After almost a decade, I thought, my goodness, what else am I going to do with my, you know, the remainder of, yeah. of my career? And um, fortunately, uh, this opportunity, you know, opened up for me. And uh, I got to be uh, uh, headhunted to be the chief operations officer for uh, Sakum Noto Group Holdings. Mm -hmm. Um, I can say their name because, you know, a <laughs> uh, black-owned firm. Yeah. And, of course, all the kind of questions you'd ask, you know, around a black-owned firm coming from corporate. Yeah. Um, you know, do they have, uh, are they sustainable? Uh, do they have good governance in place? You know, what am I going to do there? Um, so I think it was really quite a big leap of faith mm. uh, moving from very comfortable corporate space into the unknown because now you are dealing you know, with a uh, family-owned business, which uh, is really run, owned uh, majority by the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a black-owned business. Uh, you've never been in that space before, um, in a way you are reporting directly to the CEO and president, mm -hmm. who is the founder and majority shareholder. You know? mm -hmm. So very different dynamic than in corporate, where mm -hmm. there is a board that sits there, and you know mm -hmm. they give a mandate to a CEO. In this case, you know the mandate is directly coming from mm -hmm. the owner of the business. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, it was investments, right? Mm -hmm. Knew absolutely nothing about <laughs> what that yeah. what it was all about. Yeah. But the great thing about you know my job is that it's quite a broad uh, role. It's mm -hmm. uh, the engine room of the company. Mm -hmm. um, it's really what brings and sticks everything together. Mm. Uh, one of the core roles that I perform in my job is ensuring that um, we bring the board together, um, have a strategy, uh, cascade that strategy down to exco level uh, throughout the organization all the way to the cleaner in the company. So mm -hmm. um, that's one of my core deliverables essentially for the first quarter in the year. So mm -hmm. I need to make sure that uh, we, after the stretch session in, in December, that everybody knows what to do mm -hmm. and that all the plans you know from exco level all the way to uh, junior level are cascaded and of course that kick starts the performance management cycle mm. and you can imagine that coming from an hr you know background i know performance very well mm. back to back right mm. um, and so uh, that was an easy transition for me to make uh, mm. because when i started my career i started in consulting doing a lot of strategy work mm -hmm. And so what I find that this role does for me is it brings kind of together all the skills I've learned in all my roles. Um, so from strategy, uh, you know, uh, development, all the way to execution and reporting at the end of the year, seeing where we are. So that's uh, one of the things I do, but it's one of the biggest pieces of my uh, pieces of work that I do in my role. Mm. But also I oversee the core, you know, functions in the group, mm -hmm. which would include uh, corporate communications, human resources, governance and compliance, um, you know, check, 
um, uh, a bit of finance, I get involved with what the CFO does. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you do group budgets, I need to provide my input there um, and provide some guidance in terms of how things work. Mm -hmm. You know, policy uh, development, and then I report, of course, into the board committees and into the full board uh, every quarter and at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, what I do. It sounds like you've got a lot on your hands. Uh, <laughs> and uh, given your background, I mean, you studied psychology yes. at WITS, uh, and then you went into consulting. Yeah. And then from consulting, you went to HR. Uh, all these roles weren't necessarily linked. <laughs> it was, the next role was a completely different thing. But this current role that you're doing, yeah. it looks like it kind of you know, amalgamates all your previous experiences quite nicely. Yeah. Uh, and 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 help helps you to you know deliver uh, the way that you are doing. Is that is that the case? Yeah. So I think you're spot on in terms of uh, the fact that you know all my previous roles kind of um, uh, you know consolidate uh, get consolidated in my current one. Um, and you know, uh, funny enough, about a year and a half ago, I was involved in a panel, and they were looking at the role of you know HR in understanding and supporting business and mm -hmm. they called me in to speak somewhat uh, as someone that's you know been on both ends of the spectrum um, the one end being uh, you know people uh, management and the other one being uh, business mm -hmm. um, because in my role currently so as a chief operations officer essentially this role is not the same in every organization so mm -hmm. it depends on what the CEO of that company does mm -hmm. and what they need uh, uh, for you as a COO uh, or as a 2IC essentially mm -hmm. to uh, offload from their plates so yeah. that they can focus on other strategic uh, matters. So essentially I run the office, you mm -hmm. know, from whether or not there is enough sugar for tea for people. You, you'll you be surprised, eh? mm -hmm. people want sugar in their coffee <laughs> and milk. And it becomes your problem. It becomes my problem, right? Um, uh, all the way to, you know, whether or not we are delivering uh, in terms of what the board has given us to deliver. So yeah. it's quite a nice way to consolidate everything because essentially uh, I am the, uh, the, the heart and the soul of the business mm -hmm. and I make sure that everybody uh, you know, coordinates their efforts and works together mm -hmm. um, in order for us to deliver according to what the board uh, wants us to deliver and to support the CEO in mm -hmm. ensuring that. So the CEO can't be you know, uh, worried about you know, whether or not they Mm -hmm. is a receptionist uh, you know or whether there is sugar in the kitchen or whether or not we've got enough stationery in the you know so mm -hmm. that's my job to ensure that you know we've got resourcing people money and uh, mm -hmm. and everything else that we need uh, to run the business yeah and and when you took on this role or when you were hot head head hunted um what do you think it is that you know the company or the ceo saw in you given that you didn't have uh, cool experience <laughs> before. Yeah, so I think the I think what all of us come out of university with is the ability to learn, and um, I think given the fact that I had had quite a wide ranging experience before I got to that, uh, I mean, if you think about consulting, in consulting you do you respond essentially to clients' mm -hmm. uh, uh, needs, right? Mm -hmm. So one client could want a strategy. One client could say, come and review my uh, policies and procedures. Mm. One client you know, could say, I would like a talent development strategy. Please help me develop that. One could say, I want you to audit my organization. I want a skills audit to understand mm. where I am you know, in terms of uh, whether or not I've got enough, the, the right competencies, the right mm. place uh, to deliver my strategy. So essentially, when you come from that perspective and you also have worked in various industries, I worked in government, I worked um, in manufacturing, I w went back into consulting to do psychometrics, uh, then I went into retail. So essentially, your, uh, you know, the, the spectrum of skills you bring to the table mm -hmm. uh, is quite useful. And also, I think my understanding of business as well. So. I think my, the job that I did before mm -hmm. that, I'm not sure if I can mention the company, but the job I did before that, which was in manufacturing and uh, uh, food and beverage, right, mm -hmm. um, was quite a, it was a nice uh, mix of HR and understanding business. And there mm -hmm. were quite 
um, quite strict around, you know, HR needs to understand what the business does and mm -hmm. support um, line management to deliver on the strategy. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think all of those competencies that I learned in previous roles came in quite handy, you know, mm -hmm. in the current role that I do. Mm -hmm. So the only difference is that the sector here was investments. Mm -hmm. I needed to upskill myself uh, in understanding how the investment process works, how the investment world works. Um, and so I did a short program, you know, it gives uh, strategic finance and mm -hmm. um, uh, and investments. Okay. So that was kind of a bridging the gap for me yeah. uh, to understand, okay, when the investment guys go out to do a, de a deal, mm -hmm. this is how the life cycle of a deal works. Yeah. And that's the kind of uh, business I'm supporting as a chief operations officer. Mm -hmm. But the great thing is, because I was in a small company, at that time I think we were about 25 employees at, ma at, at most, right? Mm -hmm. I was the HR manager, I was the governance manager, I was the... So any role that didn't have someone, yeah. someone in, I would have to plug in. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine the kind of business acumen you develop yeah. as you do that uh, is invaluable, right? Um, so that was, I think, uh, the, the great thing about me uh, coming into a new space, um, and I think it goes to, um, uh, I suppose it, it, it goes to speaking to, don't be afraid of the unknown. Mm. Um, I believe strongly that anybody can learn uh, in any role, as long mm. as their attitude is right. Mm -hmm. um, you can come into a role, really understand, learn, if there are any gaps, you know, patch the gaps and continue. Mm. So that, 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 I think that's what happened in this case. Uh, the, the point around don't be afraid, um, I think most people get afraid of failing yeah. and the repercussions that they come <laughs> after. How do you get over that? Well, the thing is failure is part of life, you know. Um, you win some, you lose some. Um, but I think failure should not paralyze us from mm. uh, venturing out into new opportunities mm. um, because that's really what I think as humans we... Uh, drives us and helps us grow. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't help for, in my view, for someone to stay in one company, in one role for 23 years. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at where the world of work is going, um, you actually need to have uh, a set of diverse and transportable skills that mm -hmm. you can plug in into an environment. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of uh, employees that we're looking for mm -hmm. now, I think, in the current world of work. Mm -hmm. So the days of functional specialists and that kind of thing are really gone, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you go and study um, IT and you don't beef it up with something else in business. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you're going to be you know, left behind yeah. <laughs> because the guy that comes in with a much more broader skill set yeah. is the guy that's going to get the job. Yeah. Uh, as much as we're looking for an IT person, um, the thing is, are you going to be able to understand our business and give us, uh, you know, business solutions that help us move forward and grow, mm -hmm. or are you just going to come and tell us that system A isn't working, system B isn't working, let's buy system, you know, that system, that system, um, and so, and then you do reports. Uh, but I think businesses now are looking for uh, people that have got a lot more diverse skill set that you can uh, plug in. Actually, that was the topic of my master's degree, mm -hmm. uh, looking at you know ge generic uh, competencies, mm -hmm. graduate competencies, and what gives an, an advantage mm -hmm. uh, to graduates that come in to an organization with a much more broader skill set yeah. than just what they've studied. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's brilliant insights. And you mentioned working for a small uh, company. Uh, it's quite different to working for a big corporate. Yes. Uh, what are some of the key differences that you've observed? I think accountability at a personal level is a lot more closer. Mm -hmm. um, in a big corporate, you can hide, you know, uh, if you're in a big department mm -hmm. and you're that person that does something on the other side, you know, you can easily hide. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a small company uh, where we know, you know, we've got 25 of you and we expect certain deliverables from each of you, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes very difficult to hide. Mm -hmm. And so if you come in and you say, Ah, I can do this, I can do that, I can fly planes to the moon, I can, you know, design rockets and stuff like that. <laughs> we expect you yeah. to design the rocket. Yeah. You know, if in three months' time you've not designed a rocket, then you are not the right fit for that role. Yeah. So I think in, in smaller companies, 
um, it's uh, accountability is a lot more closer um, and more personal. Mm. But I think also what happens in small companies is that I think you develop a lot more depth in your area of expertise a lot quicker than in a bigger company. Remember, in a bigger company, you could have, um, uh, let's say, as a functional area, finance, right? You've got a bookkeeper, you've got an accountant, you've got a finance manager, you've got a CFO. Mm. Um, in a bigger company, they can give you a very streamlined and a narrow scope of work to do because there are five other people that do the same thing that you do. Mm. And so there's no, uh, there's no scope for you to broaden yeah. uh, your experience, right? In a smaller company, you could, be, you could be called a bookkeeper, but because we want to run a lean and mean structure mm. at a very cost-effective way, we could say to you, okay, you're the bookkeeper, but uh, could you do some of the accounting duties as well mm. uh, that helps you grow? Mm. Could you do some of the uh, you know, financial management duties as well? We add that to your scope. Mm. Mm. Uh, by the time you leave there, you're more than just a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. So you've actually gathered a lot more skills mm. than someone that's in a big corporate. In a big corporate, it takes time. You have to wait for someone you know, at the next level to go or, you know, other unfortunate things to happen, which we don't want to say, yeah. um, in order for you to pick up those skills and to get you know, uh, recognized for your contribution. Mm. So I think that's the advantage of working in a smaller company. But um, you have to be driven yourself. So mm. the company is not going to do that for you. Mm. So if we see that you've got potential and we say, um, can we add this? Can we add that? Do you want to be part of that project? Um, you know, uh, in smaller companies, it's easier to... Uh, kind of bring everybody on board onto you know core business uh, uh, projects mm. and uh, you know have everybody involved and collaborate on finding solutions for the business. Yeah. That's quite interesting. I find that some people that work in in big corporates mm. making a a move into a smaller organization is is not something easy for them to digest. You speak about, okay, I work for a big corporate, it's well known, good branding, good infra infrastructure. Yeah. And now I must move to this company that's not so well known. Yeah. You mentioned earlier when you were joining your current company, you were asking yourself questions around governance, sustainability. Correct. You know, uh, uh, how do people get over that line of thinking and, <laughs> and take that step of faith if, you know, indeed the smaller companies can provide such growth, uh, such good growth opportunities? I, th I think sometimes you just got to have faith, you know, um, um, uh, and I, I don't want to call it luck. Mm. Uh, I know that, you know, that's, that people that say, you know, good preparation and uh, yeah. that kind of thing and luck and something. No, but I think sometimes you just got to have faith. Mm. Um, if you yourself have a personal vision of where you'd like to see your career end, um, I think that's a good guide in terms of then uh, whether or not you take up a role in a smaller company mm. versus a bigger company. What I found is that in big companies, and I've worked for five, mm. um, some listed, some non-listed. Mm. And in big companies, really, all you do is maintain processes, systems the way they are. Mm. It's worse when that company is headquartered outside of South Africa, because mm. what they do is they just push down whatever from head office mm. uh, and say implement, it might not be relevant for the market mm. where you're in and you might find that it's a bit, it's a bit difficult you know, to implement some of the initiatives from head mm. office. And so for me, a smaller company provides you the opportunity to be innovative in your own, own way and say you know, uh, you know, to your line manager or to the boss, you say, look, I've, I've seen that we don't have this thing here uh, or this process here, this policy here, this system here. Mm. Um, I've got ideas around how we can mm. make things more efficient here. Mm. In a bigger company, they don't need you to make anything more efficient. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all they need you to do is to comply mm. with what's there. So what I found is that um, um, you know, a lot of the interns that also come through our company, by the time they finish six months, they are so... Uh, job ready mm. and um, they are so marketable you know in the in, in the job market mm. um, that they get snatched up so quickly because mm. the when they get interviewed you know people just don't believe how much 
they have learned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for us, you know, when someone is on an internship or a learning program or whatever the, the case is, is that we make we bring them into a role directly mm. and we give them clear you know deliverables responsibilities and we say you are accountable yeah. uh, for this this is your project mm. by the time you leave here you need to tell ask yourself you know what am i going to present mm. to the next employer mm -hmm. you know how am i going to look more attractive yeah. to the next employer so i think that's what the value of a small company uh, gives you you know, that room to say, this is not there actually, mm -hmm. so what can I do? How can I innovate? How can I contribute directly? At the end of the year, you've got a portfolio of the things that you've done. And those can be legacy projects that live on in the company yeah. way long you've, after yeah. you've left, yeah. Brilliant. Let's talk about your HR career. Uh, <laughs> you, you spend a lot of time there. That's not even what you studied, uh, you know. And then you went into HR. What what was the driver for you to go into HR? Given was not your yeah. academic break background. So I, I did do industrial psychology, by the okay. way, which is um, really how you study how you know people, yeah. organizations, and uh, the environment, which is usually you know government, uh -huh. um, work together in order to create you know um, the kind of economic mm -hmm. activity that we see, right? So that's why it's called industrial. It's mm. not necessarily about uh, unions and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> but you're really studying management and management uh, uh, theory and philosophies um, to help you understand how business people and the state essentially interact mm -hmm. uh, together in the context of an organization, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when I went to varsity, I wanted to become a medical doctor. Mm. That was my dream and that was my aspiration you know and I got to first year and I discovered that you have to do chemistry physics maths and uh, biology or mm. life sciences I can't remember what they used to call it ILS mm. and physics gave me the hardest time and that time ne, in matric I had really good marks yeah I had good marks and that's why I chose you know the science route I'm like I'm the science guy so I can yeah. do medicine yeah uh, chemistry was like on another level uh, and I thought to myself mm, I don't think I am suitable for this so you actually career. started in, I did. in medicine I okay, got accepted wow. at WITS medical school and UCT oh, wow. medical school. I actually did the one year medicine at UCT also oh really <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you saw the light <laughs> and I think halfway through into first year I thought you know this is not gonna work uh, I went to the careers and development unit uh, you know, spoke to a counselor there, um, and uh, they were like, "Okay, really, what drives you?" You know, and I said, "No, I've got a passion for people, mm. helping people, um, and I want to pursue a career in that direction." And um, and she said, "So, what do your friends, you know, say about you? And what kind of conversations have you had mm. in high school with your friends about um, what they see?" You know. And I remember thinking, actually, all my friends always thought I was the shrink, you know, in the mm. class because mm. I, was, I was quiet, I was a good listener, mm. and I would somewhat provide sound guidance, mm. you know. And I thought, actually, psychology might not be a bad idea to, mm. to try. So whilst I was doing a Bachelor of Science, mm. uh, I picked up then uh, psychology within there. I discovered, oh, you get, actually get two streams here. You get the clinical stream, mm. which is a therapy stream, mm. and you get the industrial stream, which is okay. the business stream, yeah. right? And I chose the industrial stream, because mm -hmm. I think for me, I thought it's broader. I could still do therapy if I wanted to. Mm. Uh, I could do career counseling and coaching, etc., mm. etc. But uh, essentially, what I came out of it with was a bachelor's of science degree <laughs> with all the science stuff I was doing before, plus wow. the industrial psychology. Um, and I decided, you know, honest, I'm going to continue with industrial psychology and then masters yeah. do that and focus on career development and career management. And mm -hmm. so um, it was almost a natural, I suppose, progression into human resources mm -hmm. uh, from having, having had that background mm -hmm. in industrial psychology. Interesting. Yeah. And, and how did you, once you joined the HR stream from a work environment perspective, how was that experience for you? Was it what you were expecting? Was it enriching, fulfilling? Yeah. 
No, it was in many ways. So I'm glad I didn't start in a traditional HR role when I started my career. So 2007, um, when actually 2006, uh, when you know the companies come on campus and they yeah. do a career fair. You know, PwC was one of the ones that came. Um, I put my application in. They didn't say what job it was. It was just a graduate trainee program. Mm -hmm. Um, and they called me, interviewed me, and I got the job. I was uh, essentially a intern consultant, mm -hmm. you know. So six months later, they were like, "No, you're doing a great job. You know, you're consultant number one." So they, were, they used to have like consultant levels one to four, and then you become an assistant manager, then you become uh -huh. manager and uh, associate director, director, right? Yeah. So six months later, I was a consultant number one. Uh, a year later, consultant number two, um, and I'm glad I started there because there I learned the interaction between HR and business, mm. and I learned what it means to develop solutions for a business. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that you know I didn't get was the implementation part of the process because mm. as consultants, you go in there, you go and you know. Uh, tear apart and you do as is analysis mm -hmm. you uh, tell them okay this is what is wrong with you if you want to change you know from as is this is how the future looks like mm. if you want us to help you with the future we pay you pay more yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know every business yeah, does yeah. not want to do that right yeah. <laughs> so eventually you end up with a report that sits either in someone's uh, you know, office or on the shelf somewhere, yeah. if it's a government client. Um, I did a lot of, client, uh, of government uh, client work. And so then you just then miss that part where you're like, okay, I had a great, you know, strategy there, a great plan, I did a great analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could actually just go back and, you know, show them how to implement mm -hmm. and we can measure success, you know, mm -hmm. in two to three years time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, consulting, you're trying to make money. So yeah. uh, next client comes, you do the same thing. Next client comes, you do yeah. the same thing. Um, and eventually, I think I wanted to be in an environment where I can actually do both. You know, I go in, in-house, be the consultant, do the analysis, uh, develop a plan, execute, you know, at the, end of the, at, at the end of the year, report and say, you know, this is how, what we've achieved and yeah. this is how, what the impact has been on business yeah and so that's why I left consulting in the first place mm, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah but I think uh, having started there I think helped me understand um, how to position HR and I think it was a time where you know the Ulrich model of business partnering HR business mm -hmm. partnering was coming into play you know be the employee advocate the you know the business partner the yeah. admin expert you know all the four buckets yeah. you know the employee advocate so um, I think that's what kind of helped me build the right kind of competencies yeah. to bring the HR into business and but also the HR was still there and yeah. that's why I did it for almost nine years yeah but over the nine years it was different types of HR roles and uh -huh. I would choose them quite selectively uh -huh. you know so started with the consulting which gave me the strat strategic mindset uh, then went into uh, government. I was doing talent management and government. You can mm. imagine how difficult that is, <laughs> because everybody seemed to be the same. Yeah. So we had to say no, but you have to differentiate your people and yeah. you know put them in different quadrants because you know people deliver different things for the business. You know there are those that you want to be stable contributors uh, that deliver you know consistently and they are your you know you want to mm. keep them there. I suppose the strategy worked well. Uh, you know. <laughs> given you've stayed for six years as a yeah. chief operations officer now. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier in your consulting career, you were getting promoted quite quickly. Yeah. I think that's something that <laughs> almost every professional wants. Yeah. What does it take <laughs> to be on that journey? Sure. I don't know what it takes, eh? Um, sometimes I think it just... Um, I think it takes... For me, at that time, when I was working for PwC, we were three in the graduate program. Mm -hmm. Not all three of us got promoted at the mm -hmm. same time. I think I was the first to get promoted. So it was me and two other mm -hmm. ladies. Um, what I think I went in and I did was did my best work. 
there was nothing too small that any manager could ask me to do that I would say, no, I can't. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have bound so many files in there that you actually get paper cuts on mm. your hands. Mm. I never knew that paper could cut you, <laughs> mm. but paper actually can cut you. Yeah. That's how many, uh, you know, uh, th that's how much binding I did for all the teams um, in our department at that time. And I became so good, ne? every single manager <laughs> wanted me to do their, their packs, yeah. their client packs. You know, when they go to present, they'll be like, you know, please call Roddy to do this for us. You know, we know he's going to do it right the first time. And the thing about me is my attention to detail was absolutely, I'm a perfectionist. So mm. I would never send anything if I'm not happy with it. Yeah. When it gets to the manager, all they do is flip over and they're like, good shot, nothing to change, nothing to turn back, we are good to go. So for them it meant I was efficient, they could cut the time of, you know, uh, no, take this out, no, redo, etc. So I think for me, I got quickly promoted because in consulting, word goes around very quickly about, hey, we've got that young man over there mm -hmm. and this is what he did for me, this is the report he did for me, mm -hmm. this is the research he did for me, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, as a junior at the time, that's what you do. You bind, you do research, uh, you know, you write stuff. I was a good writer. Mm. Um, and, um, and I think I was, uh, when they did the consulting training course, you know, uh, one of the principles was you never send a document to your manager if it's got a mistake. Mm -hmm. They will tell you margins are, must be like this, line spacing must be like this, headings are like this, we brand our documents like Consistent this. Consistent full stops. Consistent <laughs> full stops. You know what I mean? So um, this is where we use a full stop. This is where we use a semicolon. This is where we use. So I would apply all those principles net to the T. So when I do a research paper for a manager who wants to approach a particular client, yeah. they knew that they're going to get a perfect document mm -hmm. every time from me. Yeah. And I would sit there, if I have to leave in the morning, then I'll sit there until I finish that thing, submit in the morning, go home, take a shower, come back, mm. and continue to work. Mm. So I think the, the kind of work ethic um, I had, and I still have even now, mm. was that you do the job right the first time and you do it until it is done. Yeah. Nobody else is going to do it. That's, that's brilliant. I know, I don't remember which year, you won the Standard Bank... Ah, 2015. Uh, Rising Star <laughs> Award, 2015. 2015, yeah. Yeah, that was phenomenal. Um, wow. What did that award mean for you? And why do you think ultimately you were the winner for your category? <laughs> Chief, that, that process was quite grueling, eh? Yeah. <laughs> you submit and submit and submit and submit. And they want to see proof of the stuff. You know, they want to see track record of uh -huh. the stuff that you say uh, you've achieved. You go through a panel interview. You go through the final round with uh, various executives from different companies. Mm -hmm. um, so it was quite a grueling process. Um, I, I had great support from my manager at that time was Bridget. Uh, I was still at MassMart. Um, and uh, I mean, there were some really strong contenders in that, in that space. And I was really quite, I wasn't expecting to win it because I thought, ah, you know, the recognition of being a nominee in this category is good enough for me. Yeah. And uh, when they called my name, I almost didn't hear it, actually. <laughs> so my manager had to say, hey, <laughs> you need yeah. to go up, you know, <laughs> it's you. Um, but I think what that meant for me was um, that at least industry and people objectively outside of my own work environment um, have recognized my, uh, my, my contribution mm. uh, to the manufacturing sector, but also to the profession of HR. Mm. Um, and that was, I think, yeah, it was quite uh, humbling. Yeah. I still have that, uh, that star in my awesome. office. Awesome. <laughs> Congratulations again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, of course, you are a multi-talented individual. We've just spoken about your professional career, but you are a, an award-winning recording artist. Uh, where, where, where do you find the time to do all these things? We see you on TV, you are a radio anchor. Like, uh, uh, how many people can do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, I think I always get asked that question, you know. I, and I had one colleague of mine who, who used to say, Do you have 24 hours in the day or do you have more? Did God give you more? 
And uh, no, I've only got 24 hours. Uh, I'm a dad as well of two boys. Um, and, and so I think for me, it's uh, you have to negotiate your time. Mm. You have to prioritize, I think, what is important for you. For me, the music has always been a part of my life. I joined the church choir at 13 years old. Mm. So that's been cultivated as I grew. I grew up in a family where my mom was a singer. She sang in two choirs. It was natural, you know. Mm. My cousins were into music. Mm. Um, so I always had a passion and a vision and a dream that one day I'll also do something professionally in the mm. music space. Uh, gospel was kind of the easy uh, mm. way in. Mm. Um, and so I started to pursue that. But um, I think everybody that's done music will tell you that it takes time. Mm. It takes time for you to kind of have the right conditions and environment and the support uh, to actually produce, um, you know, music professionally. Mm. Uh, for me, that only happened in 20, 2014, 2015, when I launched uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did a full album uh, in 2018, I recorded, and then I launched in 2019, um, A Call to Love. And Mm. Uh, I was very proud of that piece of work. It's, yeah, uh, well done. Yeah, and it's also expensive doing that kind of stuff. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you understand why people get signed up, you know? But uh, yeah. I, I, I chose to be an independent artist and uh, I didn't want to have to deal with the admin of being signed yeah. by a label and stuff like that. Okay. But I think for me, you create time for the things that you're passionate about. Yeah. For me, uh, that is ministry, first of all. Um, and I felt that it was a good time for me to, uh, and I think, you know, people like Bridget and Z at mm. church who mm. were like, dude, you know, uh, thank you. We enjoy you here in church and thank you for providing ministry for mm. us here in church. Mm. But, uh, there are other people out there who'd love to hear, um, you know, what God has put inside of you. So, mm. uh, if you want to try and start and we're here to support you you know so mm -hmm. i'm thankful for those two people as well who mm -hmm. just give that little nudge to say oh actually yeah. i can i can consider this i can do it you know yeah. so i always mention them everywhere i go because yeah. if they didn't i probably wouldn't have done it you know in that yeah. period or in that time um and so i'm grateful to that uh to, uh, to them for that uh, on the radio side, I've always enjoyed broadcasting, presenting. Mm -hmm. uh, I MC professionally as well, corporate gigs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that also kind of was a natural progression. It was a matter of timing, you know. Mm -hmm. So when the music project got done, I thought, okay, I can now explore broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I got uh, an opportunity right as the lockdown started mm -hmm. in 2020. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, how did these opportunities come about? <laughs> <laughs> so I think so. There I was sitting um, and listening to Rainbow FM, and I was thinking, I'm sure there's something I can do here. You know, yeah. uh, luckily I knew someone, uh, one of the pastors in church, who was also yeah. a presenter on Rainbow, and I said, you know, Pastor Stuart, how do we get into this thing? Because I think I'm interested. Are you guys looking for anchors? Yeah. I would like to try. You know, I've never broadcasted anywhere. Yeah. Uh, this would be my first time, really. And um, he said, oh, that's fine. Actually, we are actually looking for presenters. Um, send your CV to, you know, the programs director and let's see what happens. So yeah. I sent my CV. Uh, they called me the following day. Uh, the following week, uh, I was shadowing someone. Uh, the week following that, the president said, we're locking down the country. <laughs> and I was left, you know, with no choice but to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and literally, I mean, I had, I think I had two sessions of shadowing. And uh, my first solo, you know, broadcast um, uh, session was so scary. I, I was like, okay, I have to talk. I have to know how the desk works. I have to put this one down, put that one up, make sure I'm not on the air whilst you know things are happening and it was quite a yeah a scary thing but eventually it's like it's like riding a bicycle you know you get to you learn get you fall it. you know and uh you get better at it and it becomes a natural part of your life fantastic yeah and then you won an award for your one of your songs i believe no for the album two for the awards. album yeah wow yeah so i first won the chivenda music awards for new best newcomer uh-huh um, that's a Limpopo um, awards uh, ceremony. 
and then I won the uh, best uh, R&B song, gospel R&B song for the Crown Awards, uh, uh, which which happened in Durban. So the the, the national gospel yeah. awards, yeah, yeah. fantastic. So I got those two awards. Congratulations! <laughs> and you <laughs> find you. all these things that you do are they all in sync or? You have to sacrifice a lot. Uh, do they all They're come all together? Sync. They all come together. They're all in sync. Okay. Yeah. Including your role as a coup. <laughs> Including my role as a coup. Interesting. Yeah. How so? So, um, so I work for a company that is very philanthropic. Um, so we've got four foundations uh, that okay. we support. One of them uh, hosts quite a number of events, mm. right? So um, instead of the, of us spending money on expensive MCs, I usually am the MC for mm. those events that we do, whether they're business or they're forums or roundtables, whatever the case is. Um, if we need entertainment and music, I can provide that. <laughs> so, you know, we, yeah. we save money <laughs> in yeah. all kinds of ways. So, in a way, there is integration, you know, mm. I don't have to split myself up into uh, a thousand uh, pieces. Yeah. Um, but I also do my own external, you know, um, uh, gigs where I charge and I get paid, and mm. it's uh, it's business. So I, I have a manager for that. Yeah. As we round uh, up, uh, I want to understand for someone like you who's done so much, top achiever, uh, successful professional, what do you do behind closed doors that's <laughs> helping you uh, be this person that we see here? So. Wow, that's a, that's a big question, eh? <laughs> what do you do? do? I, I, think, uh, I, I think, first of all, né? I think all of us um, have to acknowledge that we are on our own race. Um, I compete really with um, myself and the journey that I believe God has set before me. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that as individuals, we are multidimensional. I think God deposits um, everything He needs to deposit in an individual mm. uh, for them to be a blessing to other people. Mm. And it's our job to find all those things that God has deposited in us, mm. develop them. And it's like the story of the, of the talents, right? Mm. Um, and so for me, you know, sometimes people say you're doing too much, and I say, no, I'm doing. Uh, I found what God has put in me and I'm exploiting everything that he has. Mm. I want to die empty. Mm. I want to die not having any regrets about, hey, I could have been a TV presenter. I could have been a radio broadcaster. I could have been a what? I could have been, you know. So mm. I think for me, if I discover that I can do it, um, I will definitely pursue it, exploit it. And once I'm satisfied that, okay, I think I've done what I needed to do here, then I move on to the next thing. But that also comes with, um, uh, as you say, uh, you know, the, the need to have a good support structure. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to look after yourself. You need to know when you are uh, reaching burnout. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just being a, a coup alone is quite a big mm -hmm. ask, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think once you understand where your pressure points are, where your st what your stress cells are, um, you're able to you know, navigate through them. For me, what I found helps is, so I have a, an, an executive coach. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a counselor, she's a therapist, but she also does uh, coaching of business executives, right? Mm -hmm. So when I feel like it's getting too much, um, you know, I just call her up and say, I need a session with you. Uh, to just go talk through a few things, you mm -hmm. know, at that point, and then I find that's a safe space for me to um, offload, mm -hmm. you know, to also um, bounce, you know, some of the things with uh, with her, mm -hmm. get perspective outside of. Because when you're busy doing all of these things, you're you're like this, right? Yeah. So it helps me to kind of lift my head up a little bit out of the sand and say, okay, what's happening around me? Uh, what impact is it having on my health, on my, you know, psychological uh, well-being, mm -hmm. uh, on my relationships, you know, so we need to live and lead well-rounded lives, right? Mm. But it doesn't happen automatically, so mm. you need to have a, a pretty good sense of, uh, of awareness mm. of 
uh, of what's happening within yourself mm. in order to do that. Sometimes you might just need to take a break yeah. and stop. You know, I did that last year in mm. 2021. Yeah. I took a break, three weeks, and stopped, mm. you know, to reflect, uh, stop to give your body a bit of a rest, give your mind a bit of rest, mm. you know, um, give yourself a bit of rest from external, you know, interaction, relationships, you know, you tell them, no, guys, I'm not available for the next three weeks, mm -hmm. you know, I just need to be left alone. Mm. And for me, because I'm an introvert, that helps me to recharge. Mm. Uh, as you can see, all the things I do are very much about uh, mm. giving mm. and giving and giving. Um, and so eventually you get depleted and so you need to go back into a safe space mm. and, um, and recharge. Mm. Um, I think that's very important for anybody in any profession, uh, in any career, in any field. Mm. Um, I advocate for mental wellness uh, because sometimes you need help. Mm. And that help comes from someone that is looking at you and helping you uh, resolve issues, resolve the stressors, you know, in your life mm. uh, without being a part of it, you know. so. I think uh, that's what I do behind closed doors to make sure that I don't go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people are under a lot of pressure and stress mm. and are not coping and are using medication and all kinds of things, alcohol, yeah. you know, to cope because we, we all, we're human after all. We're not German cars, you know, mm. that just go into a service one day, it's out, you know, at the end of the day and you continue driving. Uh, we. We are human beings, we're quite complex. Uh, we've got scars from the past. We've got mm. uh, a whole host of things we need to deal with mm. um, and, uh, and manage. And so uh, a little bit of help from other people helps yeah. now and again. Fantastic. For those who may not know, as we round down, uh, what does an executive coach do? Is it some, something that everyone can afford <laughs> or you have to wait until you get to a cool position where the company can sponsor? <laughs> Uh, it doesn't have to be expensive, you know. I think um, most medical aids will pay because uh, it's therapy essentially, you know. Um, but sometimes you might need uh, a, a certified executive coach who mm -hmm. deals specifically with your career, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and that you might have to pay and do mm -hmm. sessions, you know. You, you agree with your coach. And, and sometimes you need to find... Um, um, a coach that you resonate with, mm -hmm. a coach that uh, you feel safe to explore different, uh, you know, discussions, mm -hmm. uh, because it gets very personal. Mm. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you have to talk about okay, what's working in your current mm -hmm. work environment, what mm -hmm. isn't working. Um, do you have to stay? Uh, do you have options to leave? Mm -hmm. uh, if you leave, what does that look like mm -hmm. for you? You know, so. <laughs> Essentially, it becomes, and, and then you, talk, you also talk about, okay, what, is, what other, because you're not, you're not, you, you're not a, an island, right? You live within a context as an individual. You've mm -hmm. got a family, you've got children, you've got extended family that you must help, you've got uh, siblings, you know, so there are other things that then, you know, become extraneous factors that then contribute to kind of you needing, you know, someone to help you mm -hmm. navigate those different uh, issues. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know price-wise how much, you know, executive coaches cost, but uh, usually um, medical aid should be able to cover that. But if it's not, I think if you're serious enough, enough about uh, your own career and your own growth mm. um, should be and getting to the next level, you should see it as an investment. Yeah. Brilliant. Any parting words? Wow, parting words. I would, I would just say, you know, um, I, want, I want to emphasize that we are not one-dimensional beings. Mm. You know, I think we've got a spirit, we've got a soul, we've got a body. Uh, we've got different talents and gifts that God gives us. I think it's our job to find them, discover them, exploit them, and use them to empower other people mm. and really to be a blessing to to others and to share. Uh, I'm a big believer in that, um, you know, don't just say to someone, um, you know, who comes to you seeking for advice or whether it's career advice or in any other aspect of their life, 
uh, you know, don't just, you know, say top surface things and say, no, you'll be okay. Uh, you know, I think we need to be a lot more practical about how we support, you know, others to ascend as well to where we are. So I think opening doors for others, I think, and creating space for others to also uh, find opportunities and shine. I think that's one of my uh, biggest um, um, yeah, passions in life. So I really enjoy um, you know, finding someone who says, I need help, I need to, I'm stuck in this rut, in this career, uh, what can I do? You know? So I think for me, the parting words is if, if you've had the opportunity to be successful, and have great opportunities, um, create space for others practically. Don't just say, you know, you'll be okay, uh, you know, and you give them theory and, you, you know, I think let's be practical about how we assist others and pull them up to our level, help them grow, and they will do the same. I think that's how really uh, we're going to be able to uh, ensure that uh, specifically as black professionals that we you know we, we we fill up those top level positions and we contribute uh, to the economy and the growth of the, of the country